So moving on then, in Deleuze and Guattari's The Thousand Plateaus to the next chapter, we have chapter 7, Year Zero, Faciality. Year Zero is, of course, the year of Christ, the birth of Christ. And Christ will become, what they will say in this, is the, uh, the white man, the average white man, uh, the face of the white man. So um, Camille Paglia, actually, in her book Sexual Personae, uh, makes an interesting comparison that I think is, is pertinent to this discussion where she says that if you contrast the Paleolithic figurine known as the Venus of Willendorf uh, with the sculpture head of the the sculpture of the head of uh, the Egyptian pharaoh Queen Nefertiti it's interesting because the contrast shows that in the case of the Venus of Willendorf we have a, a fat plump heavy mother goddess with no face but Nefertiti is all face and exclusively face and only face. And so we have in the intervening epoch there, uh, the face has been produced. So the face is not a universal, it's produced. Uh, it's something that comes into being. Although uh, D and G in this book, of course, don't want to suggest or imply any kind of evolutionary model, that there's been an evolution. It's simply that they're drawing a sort of uh, topographical map upon which the different sign regimes and their structures can be mapped out. Uh, they don't see them as evolving. So what we have in the case of the Venus of Willendorf then would be a pre-signifying tribal regime. The pre-signifying regime is the tribal regime in which the face as such does not exist because it's hidden by the mask. And what the mask does is it effaces the face and shifts the head back into the head-body relation of the animal. The face and the head are not the same thing. The face is something that's produced in the signifying and subjectifying sign regimes uh, but in the tribal regime, it's something that's effaced with the mask that hides the face and pushes the head back into uh, the seamless head-body relationship and traces a destratification process along a path of becoming animal. Uh, the mask is usually, it has some association with an animal most often in like in Native American uh, tri or tribal art all over the world. There are always these becoming animal associations, so they destratify the human uh, and trace a pathway uh, down into the, the stratum of the animal. So the face, the production of the face in the signifying regime, uh, which produces the face with a capital F, what it does is that it decodes the head. The head has to be decoded from the rest of the body, and uh, it separates it into a new system, uh, what they call a, a holy system, a system where there's a surface with holes, whereas the previous system of the pre-signifying tribal regime is a volume cavity system in which the body is emphasized and there's a very haptic tactile emphasis the, the breast for example is a volume the mouth is a cavity uh, the two put together form an assemblage but it's a very haptic proprioceptive one uh, that is um, <clears throat> that is transformed and deterritorialized with the production of the face in the signifying regime so the face is then produced and you have a deterritorialization process now it's deterritorialization they say that determines um, where an organism goes uh, along the strata, which stratum it will come to occupy. For example, uh, the human uh, is a being that has the most, many more processes of deterritorialization than all the other animals, and these deterritorializations have shifted him into the anthropomorphic strata. For example, they say that the hand uh, is a deterritorialized paw, and the tool that forms its correlate, the hand tool correlation, the tool is a deterritorialized branch, or as in 2001 A Space Odyssey, where we see it as a deterritorialized bone, uh, in the lips breast uh, assemblage that I was just talking about, uh, the breast of the upright, of the upright uh, woman is a deterritorialized mammary, gl mammary gland, whereas the lips of the child sucking the breast are a curving outward of the mucous membrane uh, to, for to form the deterritorialization of the lips, which is a a deterritorialized animal snout uh, to form the lips breast correlate. The lips are, are the correlate to the breast in that particular assemblage. Uh, and then we also have the head. The head is deterritorialized uh, in, in a relative way from the animal, uh, although the face is an, is an absolute deterritorialization because it removes the head from the body, head, the body, uh, head system of the animal and in the pre-signifying regime the landscape that goes along with the head and the face, there's a face-landscape correlate, uh, the landscape is, is itself a deterritorialized world. Uh, the primitive uh, forest world of the primates is a milieu, and the movement out onto the steppe deterritorializes that milieu into a world, 
and the production of a landscape in human culture, especially in the art, is a deterritorialized world. So that the landscape that forms the correlate to the face that has been produced through the deterritorializing process uh, is itself a deterritorialized um, entity, a deterritorialized world. So uh, all these processes of deterritorialization then determine what level of the strata that the organism belongs on. And in this case, the production of the face uh, deterritorializes the human and shifts it into the stratum of the sign regime, specifically the signifying and subjectifying sign regimes that come in, both of which have their own forms of faciality. Uh, the faciality of the signifying regime, the traditional signifying re regime, which I suppose comes in with the production of the state apparatus during the Bronze Age, uh, where we have a despotic, uh, the despot that forms the assemblage of power for that regime, the despotic assemblage of power, uh, comes in in that period, and the face is in what's called en phase in French, where it's direct on. Whereas in the passional regime, the face is based on a regime of betrayal, passional betrayal, and it's, and it's in profile. But the two are together, and in Western Europe, the two are mixed. So that there has been a process of deterritorializing de and re-territorializing in Western Europe uh, when the process took place whereby all the pre-signifying tribal regimes were Christianized, and through the Christianization process, the semiotic regime, the pre-signifying semiotic regime of the tribal world was dismantled and taken apart, destratified basically, and recoded by the mixed regime of the uh, subjectifying and signifying regimes. The West is based on a mixed regime in which the two assemblages of power are in the one case, in the uh, despotic regime, the assemblage of power that is used to enforce its overcoding on this new territory is despotic and the assemblage of power for the uh, subjectifying regime is uh, authoritarian. It proceeds by contract. And so what we have in that case is that faciality uh, is governed by its own abstract machine, and the abstract machine is what DNG called the, the white wall black holes uh, abstract machine, which is activated and forms a kind of backdrop. The white wall becomes the kind of uh, metaphoric backdrop, as it were, upon which the black hole of the face is inscribed. And uh, during this overcoating process, then, the pre-signifying regime of the tribal world is dismantled. There's a shift away from the body, away from corporeality, you know, the Celtic uh, tattooing process, uh, the Viking helmets that are worn that are kind of becoming animal. Uh, all that is shifted, recoded, dismantled, and uh, forcibly overcoated by the mixed regime of the signifying and subjective uh, Western European regime, of which the faciality of the white man's face becomes the primary uh, signifier in the, at the center of the system. It becomes the primary means for overcoating the entire system. And when this process takes place, as they say, the, um, it's best configured in Byzantine art, where we get the, the image for the first time of the Christ Pantocrator who bores his gaze right directly into you with his burning eyes. There we have the eyes as black holes against a gold background that stands in for the white background. But that is the basic visage of the average white man that forms the basis for racial exclusion in this mixed uh, semiotic regime of Europe that overcodes all of these other earlier tribal regimes. And um, it becomes the basis for exclusion because those who do not, there's a biunivocal process whereby uh, the first thing that happens is the identification of the face. It's as though you slide into a pre existent face. We say, Oh, he has a chin of a perfect West Point cadet. He'll fit right into a military education. Or we say, oh, uh, Billy Zane looks like Marlon Brando. He fits right into the Brando visage. We'll cast him. Perfect. Robert Redford is a kind of James Dean. He fits right into that face. So uh, in the, the biunivocal aspect of this, ab this abstract machine of facialization is first the recognition of the pre-existent archetype of the face that the individual slides into, but the second aspect of this biunivocal function uh, is the exclusionary yes-no, where the face is either accepted or it isn't. Uh, you can think of the crude example of this is on MTV, for example, when uh, Christopher Cross did his sailing song for MTV, and the way he looked was excluded by the medium, so different facial a different faciality, that the medium has its own faciality that is based on an exclusion, and you have to put in beautiful visages. The Millie Vanilli have beautiful faces, so they're coded into it, whereas the singers of the, the actual songs don't have faces that fit 
uh, the sign regime of MTV, so they're excluded. So there's always this principle of yes, no, of identification of the face first, and then acceptance or rejection of it insofar as it maps onto and matches the overcoding regime of the face that that, that regime favors. The Asiatic signifying despotic regime is going to have a different face, a more Buddhistic one perhaps, uh, that will exclude other visages, and it becomes a kind of basis for racism uh, and exclusionary practices within uh, these, these sign regimes. And then so what we have then is we have the, um, in the two regimes, the two main regimes that they talk about is the signifying and the subjectifying regimes. Remember where the signifying despotic regime is paranoid and the passional subjective regime that begins to come in with the Jews uh, is not paranoid but passional and based on betrayal. Um, the two, they give these sort of diagrams that correspond to each where the diagram of the uh, signifying regime is uh, in terms of the faciality with the white wall and the black holes are the eyes that proliferate from a center. You start with two eyes, pretty soon you have a four-eyed machine where you have the, the master and the student which form a four-eyed machine or any such relationship, the policeman and the person that he pulls over, uh, the judge and the person who is being tried. It's a four-eyed machine. And the eyes in the despotic regime can proliferate uh, from a center out of a periphery because everything proceeds in the signifying regime in concentric irradiations of signifiers that just continually spread out while forming a periphery by means of which certain elements are included, certain elements are excluded. Uh, in the subjective regime, it, it's a kind of uh, it's governed by a kind of cyclic attractor. What in chaos theory would be called a periodic attractor. It's, it's cyclic, whereas the subjectifying regime tends to center on a single black hole and tends to trace a line of flight into that black hole where the black hole functions as the subject. The subject is himself a kind of black hole, a basin of attraction, and to put it in terms of chaos theory, a point attractor. Uh, Tristan and Isolde trace a maritime line of flight as the passional couple who is eventually sucked down into the black hole of, of the Liebestod, the death song. Or in the case of Christ and Judas, there's a passion that traces a line of, a, a line of, uh, of abolition down into the black hole of the crucifixion. Uh, so the subject can get caught into the sort of black hole that he can't get out of, and he's nailed to a single face, a single faciality, the face of the beloved, perhaps, or whatever the point of subjectification has become that has formed this black hole event horizon into which he has been sucked, and from out of which he can't get, unless and until there has to become uh, a process of defacialization or a dismantling of the face that allows him to destratify, move out of the boundaries of that facial regime, and move into an A-signifying diagram where he can draw the new, the new diagram of the new face that will uh, evolve and assemble a new sign regime. So there has to be a process of the dismantling of the face, what they call a defacialization, to get out of its bondage. Remember in Deleuze and Guattari, we're always trying to find the lines of flight that will trace us, that will give us escape routes from the overcoding of the dominant system or the dominant reality or the dominant sign regime or the dominant stratum, whatever it is that's bonding the, the sort of body without organs into the strata. There's always a line of flight that they're looking for to try to trace an escape path from out of this. Uh, and so that uh, is basically the gist of this chapter on faciality, which I think is a brilliant one. It's a lot of fun to read. It's one of the funner chapters in the book, um, but there it is.